Welcome to Impact the World, the show for and about creatives, change makers, and entrepreneurs. This is a conversation episode where a special guest shares with me what they are creating and the behind the scenes journey of their experience. Hello, welcome to Impact the World. And today's guest is none other than Colette Baron Reed. You know, the thing I love about doing this show is it has allowed me to meet people, contemporaries in my field that I have perhaps never met. Colette is one of those. We had a few shared friends, and so we had never quite connected, even though we'd been in each other's orbits a little bit. And I had long admired the work that Colette has done. She's certainly been a groundbreaking pioneer when it comes to the realms of intuition, living a life that has strong spiritual values. And so getting to speak to her, it was fascinating. You'll hear at the beginning of the show, Colette goes into some very transparent and personal detail about a lot of the things that she experienced as a young person and right through her teens and into her 20s stuff that she sees as the real foundation of who she became in the world and what she brought to the world. It's, it's really important stuff that she shares. And you'll see Colette has a ton of grace. She is not afraid of the shadow. In fact, she encourages that we shouldn't be afraid of the shadow. And it was just a very refreshing conversation. We go in many different directions uh, across the hour or so. Um, but it was a real delight to get to meet Colette and to learn more about who she is, who she was before she started doing the work that I, like many of you, now know her for. Um, and if you want to check out more of her work, you can go to colettebaronreed.com. We will, as ever, put links in the show notes below. And for those of you who are regular viewers or listeners of Impact the World, we are an independent show, so it means a huge deal if you subscribe or leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you're watching or listening. It helps us reach more people. So thank you for taking the time to do that if you do. But for today, enjoy this conversation with Colette Baron reed Colette, this is a total delight, and um, I'm I'm going to just tell everybody that we were supposed to start this 45 minutes ago. I don't think I've ever spoken for 45 minutes with a guest before we actually hit record, and it got a bit ridiculous, and we were like, let's press record, otherwise nothing's going to happen. But as I said to you earlier, it's a, it's a total delight to meet you after many years of seeing you out there and admiring what you do. So thank you for being here. Ditto. Oh, me too. Ditto. Yes, we have so much in common. And we totally, that was so true. 45 solid <laughs> minutes. I have never done that either. Like, I'm like, what are we doing? Are we supposed to be doing a podcast? <laughs> 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 no, we're making friends. All right. Yeah. All is well. <laughs> well, I'm sure most people who watch or listen to this will already be familiar with you and your work. But I mean, many, many people who don't know your work, I mean, one of the things that I think is, is very impressive about you is you've not only been working in this field for 33 years, but you have so many best-selling Oracle decks out there, yeah. as well as all of these other offerings. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, how did spirit show up in your life before you became somebody who works on behalf of spirit and with other people? Because uh -huh. I don't even know the answer to that. So um, yeah. if you don't mind sharing it, I'd love to. I, yeah, I'd love to share that. And uh, so if I were to go way back, um, I, I had the ability to tune into information that was not mine since I was really small. So when I go back to the most important memory that I have where I could say that was a pivot. Um, I was three, uh, th three, four, and five, right? There's those three years wow. um, because I know I wasn't in nursery school yet. And I know when I had the mumps, I, I used to have terrible earaches. I would like be in so much pain. And then I would see things, but I didn't know what they were when I was in the, having the earaches. But then I started having recurring dreams and they typically were around the full moon when I would sleepwalk in the house. <laughs> okay, the 
was like my mother said, they had to put up gates and everything. I would manage to get out of my crib or whatever. Um, and, but it, the dream was identical each time. And it was a very interesting situation because I would dream that I would see like dirty, a dirty, dirty place. My mother was fastidious, right? So I never saw a place like that. And I would see all these skeletal looking people like barely dressed and, um, <clears throat> and a man, a skinny man crying with a small um, uh, uh, mound of gold, like, mm -hmm. like gold pieces, right? And on the other side, teeth. Now I knew they were teeth because I had lost a couple baby teeth, right? My dad did the whole thing about the magic fairy was coming, et cetera. So I knew what they were, but I, I, I it did none of it made any sense, right? And, um, and then they, it was a horrible smell. I would smell something so gross. And then it was like, they were all being shoved in an easy bake oven. Like, I don't know how else to put it, like, like a little kid's oven, right? And uh, then I would wake up and I would be scared. And I just woke up so afraid and sweating. And um, I would go into my mom's room because I always wanted to crawl into bed with my mother um, on her side. And, and like, I had a bad dream, mommy, mommy. And when I told her the dream, th this was, this is etched in my memory. It was the only dream. She didn't want to pick me up. I felt her rejection of me. Okay. I felt her rejection of me. So I'm going to fast forward 25 years later. So I did not know that my mother was a Holocaust survivor. Mm. my mother raised us in an Anglican church and she was um, her mother was killed by a bomb. Her father was killed in Dachau. He was part of the French resistance movement. They were Polish, but he was, I don't know, some connection to France um, and in living in Berlin and Germany anyway. So she never ever spoke about anything about her heritage. So my father had just lost the families, all the family's fortune at that point. He was 75. He was an incredible man, like just the most amazing man. And it was a bad business deal, bad real estate thing. And literally it, it was a disaster. So my parents started drinking. I had already had a drinking problem, which I'll go back over to talk about that in a minute. But um, she said to me, take that cross off. Now she had bought me the most beautiful cross um, made by Russians, a Russian cross, like a, um, cause my father was Orthodox, like Serbian Orthodox. And um, anyway, so she goes, just take that off. And I said, why? She goes, because you're a Jew. And then she says, you know, those dreams. And I never understood there was these secrets around my mother, right? But she just spilled it. You know, she'd had too much to drink and just told me everything. Me and my sister were there. I think my sister was there. I, I don't remember. Anyway, but she was like telling me this and then about our grandfather. And so what I had seen <clears throat> a couple, few years later, Schindler's List came out. Remember that? Oh, completely. That movie? The movies. Right. So, and there was, I think there was a scene. Anyway, you, you just, my mom told me that the SS officers would pull, they would pull, well, the, not the SS, but the, the jewelry, the, sorry, the gold <coughs> was taken off the teeth to make jewelry for the SS officers, girlfriends and wives. And it was being, they were pulling them out of the Jews who were going to be gassed or the gypsies or the gays or whoever it was. Right. Cause it's, people think it was just Jews and it was lots of people. Yeah. But, um, so that, um, I, I went into a part of my mother that was really, really private to her. She was a very private woman and she came to Canada to make a new life. Even if she was going to change her religion, change her story, she's going to make up a brand new story for herself, which a lot of people did after world war II met my dad who was 20 years older than her and the rest was history. But um, then like, again, I, nobody knew what that was, but I kept doing things like that. Like I kept all of a sudden knowing, you know, that my mother's friend uh, on the phone, uh, that the Paul, the plumber was having an affair. I didn't know what that meant. And I'd be like, mommy, <laughs> you know, like, right. So, and I would, I don't know. And then I would know, oh, the, the one that really reminded me was when I knew that the, so there was an Austrian bakery up the road and they had these chocolate cakes with green sprinkles. All right. So there's like, it was called the Vienna bakery. So my mom would take my sister and I there. So we would have a little piece of cake. So, and I wasn't allowed to walk up the street, but I knew that 
the baker wasn't going to be there. So I went there to, to sit and make sure I had the cake. My, they thought I was lost. So I was in there. My mother was yelling, yanking my arm and I'd have to leave. There I was little me because they called my mom, right? You know, like your daughter, if you're, if you're missing it, a five-year-old kid, she's here with a chocolate cake. So, um, and when I went home, I said, he's, there's not going to be any more cake. There's not gonna be more cake. Well, he died right uh way just a few weeks later so i didn't know what i didn't know like i just knew what i knew right yeah. so but that made me feel I, I never fit anywhere i had too many feelings and i didn't know where i ended and anyone else began and so for me those kind of psychic boundaries were too open ever since i was little so i don't want to bore everybody with all the rest of it but i will say that the, the highlight was when my nanny, my Scottish nanny, Mrs. Kelly, uh, came to look after us. And she was an old Scottish woman with that heavy brogue. And she had something wrong with her esophagus. She would kind of croak like a frog every once in a while, right? She was a real trip. And she had like, you know, the perms that were super tight mm -hmm. on your head, right? Anyway, <laughs> so she was very strict. Oh, she was the worst cook on the planet. And we had to eat all her food. But anyway, my parents would go out. She would look after us. She was a psychic. So she would have her little blue haired friends over when my parents would go out on a Sunday or whatever, and they would come over and she would read their cards at our kitchen table. So she read playing cards, but I knew, like, I'll never forget sitting there looking at the energy. I could see the energy and I knew it was something meaningful. So I think my obsession with divinatory experiences and my desire to look into it started there. And then my father, who also had the gift, um, he went, apparently when he died, his friends that, that he, they were, they were all, they all came over after the war from Serbia after World War II. And they all, they stayed friends. They all, they were guerrilla fighters together against the communists, et cetera. He would not, he would have not liked Putin, my dad. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, so when he died, they told me that I got my gift from my father. Cause no, nobody told me that. Right. And, uh, my my father went into a trance apparently one time at a coffee at a sorry cocktail party and my he told he read somebody's turkish coffee cups went into a trance and told this woman that her husband who was just over there was having an affair with the woman who was just over there and he went he didn't remember saying a thing and my it was a huge scandal and my mother forbade him ever to do that again that was never going to happen again right so so but he taught me when I was 14 or 15, how to read Turkish coffee cups and to see spirit animals. Like people think spirit animals come from Native American tradition, <clears throat> but in fact, Slavic folklore and our Slavic uh, roots were prior to 12th century, we were pagan. So to, uh, they, and they only chopped up what they wanted to keep from Christianity and kept some of the stuff that's called double faith. So all these divinatory arts and the concept of spirit animals and and uh you know how how animism because it's about animism i'm an animist that that came from there is that there's actually articles about how connected and close closely related they are to indigenous cultures over here but when people say to me i you know where did you get because i have my deck spirit animals and i'm like i learned that from my father who never met a native person in his life right so it's part of our cultural heritage so so i learned all about symbolism and they came alive for me so i would see what other people didn't see and then when i was in church because i love church okay i'll just be honest i freaking love church and i i still have no problem with religion as long as it doesn't make me wrong <laughs> what i do but um but uh because there's some beauty beauty there but i saw auras around people so the halos that were in the stained glass in the anglican church right which is like it's like being a Catholic without a Pope, right? So it was so amazing, all the pomp and circumstance. And I saw auras. So I thought that meant everyone was holy, right? Until somebody told me otherwise. But so I grew up with this view of the world that I didn't know most people didn't see until I felt them reject me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how do yes. you know that? What's that? Yeah. What is this? You know, so, and my father and mother, they were very, like they were Europeans, uh, immigrants. And I went to a very waspy, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant school. 
And the ge geography teacher basically told me that I wasn't Canadian enough. My parents were not really Canadians because my father had a really heavy accent. He spoke 14 languages and, and, and he was an educated 14. 14 languages, 14 of them. I heard him talk about that. Most of them were the Slavic dialects and Russian and all that. Right. But then Italian, Spanish, he, he spoke all the romance languages too. And English was his worst because it was hard for him to say the words. Yeah. And then my, my mother who was German, but she was Polish. Right. And she, I remember she made this German cake for our bake sale. I was in grade two and no one ate my mother's cake. And that same teacher said it's because it wasn't Canadian enough. So even though I'm white and I know I'm white, right. And I get that I'm privileged and I get all of that. I'm really, really done a lot of educating myself and learning and understanding, you know, but our, my experience growing up was that I was different, mm. right. That I didn't belong or somehow I had to prove myself or whatever. And then when I developed this ability, I was emotionally a basket case. So <clears throat> I started being bulimic when I was 14 and because my parents were very strict, like we had, they told me I was going to be a lawyer when I think I was in grade five and I just wanted to be a musician <laughs> and an artist. Right. So I was like, what? So I had to do what they said. Right. I just had to do what they said. They let me know that the house I was, they were, I was living in was their house. The drawers were their drawers. It was like the bathroom was their bathroom. And I was there. Therefore they were paying for my education to become this person. Right. So they were amazing parents, by the way, because they just wanted the best for us. But I, I, I had a lot of mental health issues growing up. And then I'm hearing all these things and I'm seeing things. And I don't know what to do with them. So at this point, you're not you're not necessarily being a messenger for others. It's just your no. mostly your experience. I would tell my friends things I saw and they'd be like, how do you know that? I went, I don't know. Right. So then I uh, I was very rebellious in my teens and um, <clears throat> so I got into trouble with, I was an addict right from the word. I'm sure when the doctor slapped my ass, I knew right away, where's the Schlebovitz? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so so, um, so I actually, that was the first drink I had. And so for the people who don't know me, I'm a recovered alcoholic, 36 years clean and sober. Anyway, so the alcohol made me feel normal. Mm -hmm. That was the other thing. I felt very normal. I, I felt normalized that nothing yes. bothered me and I was okay. So for a period, period, very short period, you know, me and my little friends, we were all the bad kids in school, smoking out the back, you know, with our, with our uniform hiked up. Um, it was an all girls school. Um, but uh, again, I didn't understand all the emotional content that I was feeling. So fast forward, I'm going to just fast forward. So um, I spent I ran away and uh, I went to university. It was, I went to law school. I, I had a, an overdose um, before final exams in this one. I don't even know how I managed to, to pass any classes. Okay. So, but I was pretty smart. Um, and then I was like, I can't do this. I just can't do this. So I wanted to pursue music. Nobody could stop me. Um, and I was pretty good. Um, but I needed a day job. And then I ended up falling in with these, you know, people and this particular music producer who worked with Rick James. I don't know if you ever heard of him, right? Um, super I know free. the name, but I'm yeah. not super familiar with the music. Yeah. Um, he was a black uh, funk. Uh, he was a funk, very famous way back mm -hmm. when. Anyway, so uh, that's how I learned how to freebase cocaine. Like it was wild. And I'm glad that happened because I had been gang raped when I was 19. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and uh, and I say that very openly because I'm not for pity, but to help people understand how, you know, I had a psychotic break when it was happening. And all of a sudden I went to this space, which is now where I go to go get my readings. Like I just disconnected from myself and I was completely calm. And whatever was going on below me, okay, fine, right? And plus, I couldn't fight; it was too many, and 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 I, I, I turned into a possum, just basically get it over with, and and then I just left my body. But that experience, I think, you know, the gift in that experience was that I was able to dissociate from my personality and my need to be seen, and I could leave, and something else could come through me, and I saw the picture of this one guy who, who was locked in the basement is like, he was abused by his parents. And the other one whose mother was a, like a homeless person and 
who, you know, and <clears throat> who had stolen fish or something. I don't know, but I, I knew a few of these men and the, I had some friends who knew who they were and I told her what I had seen and she goes, Oh my God, that's, that's, that's what everybody knows about these guys. Cause it was a small town where it happened and they were very well known as this gang of anyway. And I was drunk and whatever, but I, I believe what happened was supposed to sharpen my capacity to help others. Honest to God, I do. So I wish I could say I hit bottom right after that, but it took me till I was 27 and uh, I was, and it was through the free basing and through all the cocaine mm. and bottomed out and I'll never forget when I finally surrendered to spirit literally I was holding on to a sink and looking into a window uh, like a a mirror sorry and the only good thing was that I never had a weight problem (laughs) but (laughs) I'm constantly chubby now but whatever I'm healthy but um I saw myself finally as I was not like oh get me out of this I, I won't do it again, which was my prayers up to that point. Like, please, please come and get me. And so I'll never, I promise I won't. And then I do it again. Um, but this time it was like, I'm done. I'm going to die. Like somebody help me. And I remember seeing the whites in my eyes were yellow from jaundice and my teeth were bleeding from gums because mm-hmm. we'd been up for like seven days. So I am a walking miracle of telling you this story because it's, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, she was just good at everything, whatever. No, I almost died because of my own addictions and behaviors and the things I did. And anyway, so I felt this voice and this light Then I heard it's over. Like, and I felt like I had just surrendered into the arms of the divine. And I'd love to say that it was perfect after that. It wasn't, of course, I ended up in it finally a treatment center for women. Um, and, uh, It was the most incredible experience with women from all walks of life, you know, and we were talking earlier about why diversity is so important to me. It's also because of my recovery background, you know, is, is that we, what we had in common was this, we needed to stay alive and we had all the shame and guilt and all the stuff that had gone along with the addictions, but that we would do anything to live a spiritual life and be better people. So, so I never even thought about the readings. I actually was like, don't come near me. I was like, so scared that like somebody, some, some spirit was going to come. I actually told the people when they brought me into the treatment center that I had been, that I had been um, like, like somebody we know, right. That I'd like some kind of a spirit overtook me because I need to be deprogrammed or something like, cause I didn't believe I was an addict and they went, it's okay, honey, we're going to, we're going to bring you in as an inpatient. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like AA doesn't work because I tried getting sober before, but my spiritual journey, my addict, my recovery journey is directly related to my journey as an intuitive. It is my, uh, I threw myself into my recovery journey, like they say, like a drowning man grabs onto a lifesaver because I knew I was going to die. And so I had this great sponsor. She was like, Mrs. Kelly, no, Mrs. Kelly. That wasn't, she was like, um, what's her name? Aunt Clara from Bewitched. She was, she looked like her too. You know, the dotty that, I don't know if you yep. watched the show, right? She was kind of dotty and she would make a spell and she'd end up in the garbage can. That was her. So I loved her. So she was my, you know, she, I just did anything she told me to do. And I go to unity church and then the visions started coming. When, so what I really believe when I was ready was about two years into my recovery. And um, I started at that point, I had been reinterested and reintroduced to divination as a form of um, personal development and transformation as opposed to predictive, right? So yeah. I, and I had a therapist, it was amazing. Like the universe completely, I mean, you want to talk about blueprint for my life it was laid out right but she but I could have died also it was also a choice on my part she worked with the handled tarot and so I recognized oh we're doing therapy with the tarot and then I started doing readings for my friends and then I I charged started by charging twenty dollars twenty five dollars and I certified as an aromatherapist but that's what when I put my hands on people well then the rest was history literally people didn't want me to get a massage anymore. They're like, because I talked the first time I was like, I'll never forget this, that this was a lawyer, this woman that came, I put my hand on her back and I knew Frank was her stepfather who molested her when she was eight. 
till she was 12. And that, that's why she had so many bad, like, you know, problems there. And she jumped off the table. How do you know this? I went, I, I don't know. Like, don't do this. I don't like you guys. If anybody here is a healer, don't do that. Yeah. So it was like, ah, uh, so then she's like, I want to talk to you more. And then I was able to just with the cards, because the cards were a focal point for me, because I really didn't have confidence, to be honest, that what I was tuning into was so that gave me kind of confirmation that the pictures and, and stories that I was remembering because I every when I, I for me it's like remembering someone's future it's like I remember them or their past I remember their present and I remember their future it's a memory for me it's weird and it still feels like that and that and so yeah so um but I didn't but it was my day job I just wanted to sing <laughs> And you did go and sing because you yes. made a couple of albums with at the and time, I. I, right? Yeah. I was 40 years old when I, and they thought I was in my twenties because I look young. I'm in my sixties, right? I do. I look, I don't know. I have great genes. My mother yeah, had the, yeah. you do. I, my parents looked super young too. I never, I've never had any work done either, nor will I, but anyhow, that's, I digress. <laughs> so, um, so um, the, the, the president of the label, um, I had met Eric because I was in a, um, Eric, Tori Amos and Eric had done the soundtrack for a movie. It was a sound, it was a movie called Hand of Fate. And I was one of the, the uh, it's a documentary. I was one of the subjects. So I was there with Credo Mutwa of South Africa and the Dalai Lama's Oracle of Tibet. And you know, it, was, it was amazing I got that I was even included. And uh, so, <clears throat> so I met Eric and Tori at the thing, as a screening. And I just looked at him and I went, I know I'm going to work with this guy one day. Anyway, push to make a long story bearable, um, I decided since the music singing part was tanking, no one had done a really, really good studio quality meditation CD yet at that time. This was in 1998, 1998. And so we launched Journey Through the Chakras. I had been studying with Anadea Judith at that point and uh, Carolyn Mace, you know, she was like the, the and, um, understanding the, the, East, the Western psychology of the chakra system and honoring the fact of where it came from, right? It, you know, so I know today there's a question mark around mm -hmm. all of this, but back then that there wasn't one. And um, so uh, then the, the, the guy who was the head of Virgin Records had had, had 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 the CD. We did a phenomenal, like um, just uh, multi-track with Mars Lazar who had platinum albums. He was an Australian guy. And so we did this whole thing together, spoken word. And then we had songs. Of course I had to have songs too. But anyway, so, and then it got to EMI and the president of EMI loved it. And we sold, oh my God, we outsold the Rolling Stones in the first two weeks. Like it was like crazy. So they signed me to a deal and they thought they were sending me to Eric Ross to do a chanting CD with him, like a new age, yeah. right? Like, but Eric knew I could sing and he goes, we're not doing that. You're going to, we're going to write songs. So we wrote these songs that later became Magdalene's Garden. Um, and uh, I came back and I said, I'm sorry, I'll give you your money back. But these, these demos um, are not what you paid me for. And they were like, this is really good. So the president said, we're not going to tell anybody who this is. We're going to send this music around to a and hmm. And then we're going to hear back what they say. I'm not going to promise anything to you. But if they like it as much as I do, we are going to record this. So the one guy that was there was the one person who for the year, for the years, I kind of resented, which is kind of not very spiritual, but... <laughs> Um, he had written a note to my manager, my music manager at the time that he didn't think that I had any talent really like, you know, and he was like arrogant and gorgeous looking and whatever. Well, it turned out he became my greatest supporter because he was the A&R guy there. He never knew that I was the same person, right? Until one day I just said, I need to tell you something, you know, you have changed my life. Like you completely changed everything because for the years I thought you thought I had no talent. He goes, why would I say that? I said, because I have a letter with your name on it that said I didn't have any talent. He goes, well, I was mistaken. <laughs> but so, um, but I was 40 and I was very successful as an intuitive. Like I had built a business. I was flying to London. I was doing, you know, Princess, like a lot of the Sloan Club, you know, that I was in W Magazine. Yeah, they, there was, I had a very illustrious clientele, Hollywood, the 
royalty, et cetera. And I was doing well. And I was like, I'm going to give all this up. Wait, even though I got everything I wanted, I had to give it all up. But I was at an age where I wanted to go to bed at nine o'clock at night and I had to go with the band. But I did it anyway, uh, figuring the universe would figure it out. And but what ended up happening was, is that I got a call from Hay House and I had to make a choice. Because you couldn't do both. Yeah, well, I was failing at music. Mm. I couldn't stay up late at night. It was hurting like my ears. It was like um, <clears throat> my, I have asthma. So it was too hard for my, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't have the stamina to do it anyway, I'll be honest. And there was too many drugs around. Mm -hmm. I was clean and sober. And for me, I had to say my sobriety it comes first. I went to this. Okay, so I was at our version of the Grammy Awards. Awards. So I went, I was like the teacher's pet. I went with the president of the label who the I loved him. Huh? The EMI, Junos. the Junos. Yeah, the Junos. Exactly. I went to the Junos and I was all excited. I get to go. And it was like, my album was new. And I was like, everybody was kind of like buzzing around it. Cause I got amazing, amazing critical acclaim for the record. But then they said I was old enough to be Britney Spears's mother. And that then did that. So, um, so because everybody thought what, and actually the label, when I told them how old I was, they went, what? I should have probably never told them, but they, they thought I was 27. And they're like, oh, this changes everything. I'm like, why? So it was like, oh, EMI takes a risk on a mature artist. Anyway, bottom line is, so we're out, we're all, all these rock stars and I'm sitting there and everybody's snorting Coke in the bathroom. And there's these big bottles of Amarone wine, like the expensive, like really nice, rich Italian wine. And I'm sitting there and I end up eating two entire meals <laughs> and saying to the president, I need to go home now. <laughs> I have to go home. He goes, you're not even coming to the show. I said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. So I go home all by myself. It's snowstorm in this stretch, fucking stretch limo. Oops, ding. I'm a mystical pirate. Sorry, I swear. But anyway, yeah, I'm in there at the back all by myself with the disco lights in this limousine. And I had to go home because, and I, and that's when I realized this is not going to work for me. I think it's so interesting because you know my view of the music industry when I was a kid and then I started to learn a lot as I was walking towards it myself and I had friends in it you know you have this view of oh it's great and especially if you're a woman and then especially if you're a woman or person of color as well I mean there's there's oh, so yeah. many demographics we can just keep breaking down it was such a limited club but oh, yeah. I'm not at all surprised that, you know, the ageism for you, even though you didn't look your age, became yet another reason that you couldn't break in. And yet that was, if you like, Hay House and the spiritual world. Oh, listen, uh, you it know, was game. meant to be because Hay House ended up selling my albums on my tours. Like they put me on tour and I did 110 cities. I did 18 cruises. You know, they, I, I cut my teeth. I was scared shitless. I was so afraid to get on stage and do readings. I could sing, but I was like, oh my God, what if I'm wrong? Like I had, I had, I was okay one-on-one. -on -one. So it was an amazing. Did you learn on stage immediately? Cause for example, I, I started doing the group thing with groups of 20, for example, that was how I began in 2006, going from the one-on-one -on -one to the, but it sounds like for you, you were thrust onto a big stage immediately. I taught workshops. Like I had a, I had, a, I had a workshop called the soul, the ego and the artist. Cause I was also a nerd. I was into, um, you know, <clears throat> besides my fascination with historic divination and innovating that, but I'm a Jungian, right? So I, I never finished my degree, but I was, I wanted to know how the soul speak because I believe the soul speaks through pictures, images, and symbols and how we have, the artist in all of us and how the soul uses us to create the art of our lives and how the, the machinations of the ego will either ease God out or edge God's order or right edge. E no edge God out or ease God's order. Sorry. <laughs> you know? And so I was teaching groups of 30, 35. I was teaching the meditation. I was teaching them how to see, I was teaching them how to feel auras and things, but I really wasn't doing readings. Right. So I, I, so that was only one on one. So, yeah, I was. So the answer in a very long way, your, my, your answer to your question is yes. I basically got thrown out there not knowing what the hell I was doing. And it seems like it went pretty well. 
because yeah. you know I think I probably knew of you very early on like I remember your name from maybe 12 13 14 years ago and kind of seeing you out there doing your thing and really being an ambassador for intuition and for people's ability with their intuition um thank so thank you for saying that totally completely no you yeah. you well, and you told me before we started, we were talking about your Oracle decks and you said they're in 27 languages. Yeah. Incredible. So yeah. I do think- And I just found out last two weeks that all of my decks are now published in Russian. Wow. How interesting is that? So yeah. I thought, wow. And it was weird when the, when the podcast came out too, like our podcast, we have people from the Ukraine listening, from Russia listening. It was very, very interesting that that came. And, and also- in all that area of the world, they speak mm. Russian as their first language. So that, it was very curious to see that, you know, when people are anti-Russian, I'm like, be anti-Putin, don't be anti-Russian, mm -hmm. you know? So, but it was just, yeah. So they're in, they're in 27 languages. Yeah. 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 So Colette, like just to kind of thank you for sharing. I mean, I, some of the stories from your childhood, you know, I've, I've certainly never heard you talk about, um, but I think it's so interesting to watch this kind of, uh, there's a lot of chaos in kind of like what you describe. When, when we put it together like that, it's like you were kind of forged through the chaos of all of these Fire. different elements and experiences. And yet you emerge as someone who becomes a bridge for people to the intuitive realms and an advocate for the validity and the truth of that, which those of us who are intuitive or have worked in those fields all of us feel othered at first or rejected yeah. by people so it's really important that we we have ambassadors out there for that for for everybody well you're obviously that too and no question but you know it's it's getting there you know there's a lot of ridicule there's a lot of you know you want to be accepted I don't know how many guys I dated who wouldn't bring me home to their parents um, you know, where I just, okay, fine. Then we're over. And then <clears throat> I remember dating this really gorgeous guy. And, uh, and then he was like, you know, I don't really believe in what you do. And I'm like, well, how am I, can I go? Like, you have no respect for what I do. Like, he goes, I don't need to respect that. I'm like, oh yes, you do. So out, you know, so my husband, thank God, um, eventually came along. And, uh, but besides that there, I under, like religion, <clears throat> especially Christianity and the monotheistic religion. If you understand the history of, of how everything evolved um, since the goddess culture was, there was a transition of 300 years um, around, you know, 1500 BCE, so, you know, like there's 1800, or, or I could be off on the timing, but um, we, our entire global culture was matriarchal mm -hmm. and we we're animists. Everything was alive and respected. We saw ourselves as part of, it was a partnership model. And uh, the dominator model um, that's now been very active um, really came in with the God of war, right? And it wasn't the God of war in, in classical Greeks, you know, that women had property in Greek and Roman societies, like they weren't chattel that that came later. But in the advent of these monotheistic relation, religions, it was political for people to stop having their own altars in their home. They were outlawed, the, gold, the golden calf, the snake, all of those were symbols of the goddess. So, you know, when they, they talk in the Bible, those stories, and especially in the book of Deuteronomy, where, you know, they, they say thou shalt not, you know, basically talk to spirits by yourself. You have to do that with a priest and you have to pay, right? So it was a, it was a political move to centralize worship in the temple, right? So none of us know this, right? And then of course, patriarchy took over with the advent of the blade. So you, that's that book, The Chalice and the Blade. Everybody needs to read that book. So how we got to where we got to now, um, you know, and now you can't go backwards. You, you, it's, it's no point that one of the reasons why it took me a long time to accept Hay House asked me to do this goddess deck. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not into what I see because I found a lot of the young women that I had met seemed quite trite. 
me around it, right? And I said, if I'm going to do this, I have to do a lot of research. And it changed my life, I have to say, doing that project. Oh, my God. Like, I, my poor husband, I was crying. I was, like, really getting into understanding the historical aspects of it and, the, and um, you know, how um, even the, uh, ar the an archaeologists, you know, they were white males, et cetera. So how they kind of changed things. And then the women went in and basically found Maria Gambuta. She's a Lithuanian archaeologist. She came in and said, no, these are not sexual objects. These are the, the mother, the, mm -hmm. you know, so they changed it. And the things they thought were weapons were actually grass, you know, in the cave drawings and things. So, you know, I think I don't know why I'm on a tangent like this because you asked me about me music and I don't know why I'm talking about this. Why am I talking about this? Well, I think in like how I'm experiencing it. <laughs> about making people feel welcome. Being, yeah, and I think also being a being a bridge and an ambassador Thank for you. our intuition, which yes. all of us is, and probably most people listening or watching, all of us understand as part of our life. And yet we were raised in a culture where it was separated from us, taboo, something we were supposed thank to be Thank you. That's of. why I'm getting there. That's, that's why I'm, you're saying all so this. I think. Yes, thank you. I'm like, why am I even talking about this? Okay, sorry. I'm on a I haven't really had too much coffee, but I'm enjoying this. Um, and I think it's interesting to know, to learn about, right? It, it is. is really interesting to know what we don't know. You know, history is written by the victors. You know, it's not, it, we have to really look and see <clears throat> what the real history is. Like and When we talk about our human programming and, and what this culture yeah. looks like today and why, rather than just growing up through it and accepting it when you go back, it is fascinating to see where we have been modified as a society right? and and i think often people who turn to intuition spirituality the soul we're yeah. we're looking to go beyond the limits of that modification and it's because we organically know it's true mm -hmm. it's the inherent within us is the is our spiritual connection we are never disconnected from source source is in us is inside us so you know that we are not source is not out there, there this is not a white guy in the sky it deciding isn't. if he's angry or nice like it isn't, naughty or nice you no know, <laughs> you know what's funny what you, what you said really hit me when you talked about the dating with and and people i i had the exact same experience you know i've been with steven my husband now for almost seven years and right, we met on a dating website called OkCupid. Okay yeah. And right before we met, I'd gone on several dates where if I if I would meet the people I was saying I was open to meeting and the profile I had written describing yeah. myself, I had not put I was a channeler. Uh -huh. And of course, what I had then was a series of um, a series of interactions where I thought, oh, you're editing because you think it will make it easier. Yeah, I edited. People. And then the problem was I would meet the people. And as soon as that would come out, I would literally witness someone who in one minute was connected to me suddenly go, oh, and then I'd yeah. go, oh. So I I put, I'm a channeler and I described who I was in more detail. And then I met Stephen. And even and though he's not a channeler, it's, here we are. So even yeah. I, who at that time had been working in this field, working in this field at that time for 16 years, was still in a in a kind of pro no 11 years programming around you probably should edit that out if you want to connect with that person and, and that's how deep it runs me too and mm -hmm. when I met my husband I've been doing this for 20 years no that's not true because I've been with him 20 years so 13 14 years I've been doing it full time and so as soon as I met him, I met him on a dating app too. Um, back then it was called Lava Life because I was like, there was no internet pretty much. You had to phone people, yeah. right? Like there was a kind of an internet, really not really, right? They yeah. had MySpace. Anyway, so we turned out we had all these people in common. Um, so there was the conversation led there. So we had agreed to meet right away. And then I looked at him and he's like the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen. And I, and, and like, he looked, oh, he was too, way too pretty. But I was like, okay. I'm just going to have to spill this because I don't want anything. If this guy doesn't in, is, isn't into this or if he's a prejudiced person, I need to know right now. So I looked at him. I said, I need to tell you something right now. And he thought I was going to tell him I was bank robber or something. <laughs> I said, I'm an intuitive. He goes, you're a what? I said, I'm an intuitive. He goes, like a psychic? I went, yes, but I don't like the word because it, it, it makes us a pejorative, right? He goes, well, that's cool. I was like, really? And it turned out 
that a friend of mine who had actually trained me in aromatherapy was a woman that he went to see. And he had a, pro a this progression where he saw this curvy, dark haired girl dancing on a beach because the woman said, you're going to see your future wife. And he liked tall, skinny blondes. And he was like, that can't be my wife. She's like a dark, curvy girl with tan. <laughs> so I'm like, and meanwhile, then he meets me and I'm like, I'm her. But yeah, so, but it was scary because I was like, I need to get this over with now. Like get, just to get it over with. Just tell me now, like, if this is not your thing, if you're not at all interested, if you don't respect it, I can't. As cute as you are. So this makes me wonder like what, because you, I mean, I've had this experience in my version of it, but you've met so many people around the world for whom you stand for their intuitive ability, their intuitive power. Yeah. What do you hear from them about how they're experiencing living their spirituality, being truthful about their spirituality? Like, you know, is the it same. similar stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, spiritual, let's define that, right? Because anybody can have this psychic for yeah. I want to, I want, no, but yeah. what is important is the shadow work. For me, my spirituality only came by me looking at the things I was most afraid of. Mm -hmm. And, and whatever was separating me from my, myself and my higher power was my stories of my past, of the things I did, of the things I thought I was as a result of it, like all the low self-worth, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to really dig deep and also be responsible for my behavior, my actions. And, you know, so I, I believed that I had to work for my spirituality. Like, so I, anybody can be psychic. Like, I think you can be criminal and be psychic. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you can be a terrible person and not be spiritual at all. Like, so being a psychic and being an intuitive is not necessarily a spiritual gift, but it does come from that source, but it is a neutral source, right? So you have to be the, the choice for you to grow and to do no harm, right? And to develop yourself. That's our job. So for me, and those are the people that are in my world, right? Those are the people that might, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get to that next level. And everybody talks about it, like when they get on the path and how their friends treat them differently. And sometimes their family members don't understand them or their spouse doesn't, and it can be lonely, but like I have a community where everybody is welcome, you know, and, and I, like I said to you earlier, I'm like the mother, Robert Ohato actually told me this. He says, you know, you are the, you are, your purpose here is to be the mother of all orphans. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I was like, oh, what? Well, that's such a beautiful thought because our disconnection from really the patriarchal systems, when you think about it, that, that where, where spirit is out there and, and, you know, everything is, the intellect over the soul when they both need to be equal together. But it's hard to go through that unfolding when you don't have support systems around you, yeah. right? Because not everybody's for this. Not everybody is for this. So they've all gone through similar stories than we have. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I believe, and it's one of the reasons I don't use the word psychic very often, even though there's nothing wrong with it, because it means pertaining to the soul, but I wanted it to be very user-friendly. You know, it's like, hey, you're intuitive, like you're an empath, you're, you know, I want to make it mainstream for people to realize like, oh, I saw a dead person walk across my lawn. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you know, like... But that makes sense because to you or to I or to probably many listeners or viewers, this is a normal part of our life. However, we grew yeah. up in a culture where we were, you know, the psychic, oh, they're over there by themselves, which is always so interesting because you think, well, we've all grown up in the human world. So you can't say a psychic is just this kind of strange unicorn and all they yeah. are is psychic. They're also human. They've been through all yeah. the same things you've been through, but there was this tendency to still witch hunt the psychic psychic out oh, yeah. of the group you know yeah but so now you we, we were also sharing too that we've been at this a long time you and I and now it is very mainstream and 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 it is I love seeing these young deck creators now like there's all these oracle decks there's hundreds of them now mm -hmm. like there's 458 different decks that you could buy now that's a lot there was not that many before and more and more are coming and and um you know and i'm very old school divination you know where it has to be it has to lock with the lexicon and whatever and that's not everybody's cup of tea i don't do anything fluffy bunny i do deep psychological stuff it's not for everybody 
but it's what I do, right? And there's room for everybody, right? There's room for the for people to spread their wings and say, I wonder if this is for me. I wonder if I can express this. I wonder if I can have a spiritual business uh, because it's our nature to have that. Totally. It's our nature. The more, the merrier. I I'm and, always tell people there's no multiplying. Conference. Like yes. it, you know, if if it's going correctly, if it's multiplying. In yes. More yeah. and more. I will have, you know, some of my students come on stage with me, do mediumship. I'm like, come on up. Like I believe in supporting people. Um, and, and just to just give people space to be who they are, you know, and to make it, um, okay for them to express this in a safe environment. So my little world is a very safe environment and it can be a very emotionally difficult place too, as we start to see who we have become and who we could become. And what do we need to change in ourselves in order to become the person who lives the life that we think we want, right? Oftentimes there needs to be a lot of soul work, you know, in order to get there. Um, like resentments, like anger, you know, there's nothing wrong with anger as a, it's a very good emotion. It was something I didn't know how to handle because, you know, I, I was, a, you know, there was other stories I'm not even going to tell you about that were so great. I gave you the, the easy ones, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, healthy, difficult emotions that are healthy should not be bypassed, right? Be, you know, get your rage and work it through. But if you let it simmer, like one of the things that I see today that bother me is that this idea that um, people are so self-indulgent, um, you know, like I, I, I am this, I am, I'm a victim of that. And I'm like, okay, so get it really important. You named it and claimed it. What are we going to do now to create, cross this bridge together if we want to do it together? But it's like this this, I don't know, this is a strange time in our, in our society where it's okay to just vomit over people mm -hmm. <laughs> without asking yourself, how, how important is this? Like, you know, like, where is the best place for me to share this? Um, and well, it's I also think, very singular. It's like, very you know, singular. Example, you, you can, you can experience yourself as a victim in certain emotions and behaviors and there is also another side to that story, or there is the multidimensional yes. you that will be born from that experience. Yes. It's like cancel culture. It's very, uh, you know, cancel culture is anathema to anybody who believes in healing and transformation. Because right, and growth. Exactly. And how do you grow if, you know, so like hold space for the difficult stuff and now let's go to the next stage. And I've, I am finding that very Dis dismaying mm -hmm. um you know how people they don't realize that they're creating like like a dragonfly in amber this is only me but this is not only you you are all these other things too you know you are so you are you are a diamond with many facets like otherwise i would be still considering myself as a victim like i would still be considering myself as you know as all of these different things that i was if i if i wasn't willing to keep shedding the stink sh shedding the skins keep shedding those skins and they're going to be tears with that. And that's okay. Like yeah. feeling these feelings is okay. Nobody should be bypassing them, but being indulgent around them, I find to be dismaying. Mm. Or using them as a weapon towards. Yeah. Someone. Weaponizing them yeah. Yeah. because that's happening everywhere right now, especially social media. It's crazy. It's like, I'm like, I read some things sometimes I'm like, do you even know what you just said to this person? Yeah. Like, do you not see that they're a human being? But equally, I mean, you know, this is us, uh, this is not a tangent we should probably go down. But, you know, one of the things that I have found increasingly transparent, if you're paying attention, is the polarization in our media, which was always there. Yeah. You could always feel it, see it. But, you know, some of the, we the, the, the weaponized Weapon. words yeah. that leaders around the world have been using yeah. lately. For very, uh, yeah, for very I simple things that don't that don't require such a level of war language. No, to war. I get it. And I'm I'm just watching that going on, going, oh, this is interesting. This is that rise of the darkness that my guides have been talking about. They're like, as the consciousness rises, the darkness is also going to rise and is going to want to put you all back in your box. Right, putting you in the in that. So this is why I say this too, and I tell people, like, I don't bypass anything. I find that whole only love and light, such a load mm. of horseshit, excuse me, but I can't stand totally. it, right? I want to know love, light, and shadow. 
you know, bring me, bring me the dirt and, and let's share that. Let's carry the load, but let's also then, and let's share the love and, and point the light at the dark, but don't just point the light up in the sky. Like, we, you know what I mean? Like, oh, we're in the fifth dimension now. Right. And I'm like, ascension is coming. What the fuck does that mean? Pardon my French, but it's like, we're, we're ascending out of our, the darkness that's in the room now is us too. It's in every one of us. It's like, which are we going to pick? But don't pretend that's not there. Mm -hmm. Like, don't pretend that's not there. And yeah, I've been very, it's been very transparent, the manipulation that's been going on. And that's why our work, I feel, is important to remind people that don't fall down the rabbit hole of the dark either. Mm -hmm. No, remember, stay as detached as you can and say, what do I need to do today in order for me to live in the highest good? For myself, my family, my community, right? And and what do I need to look at here that is somehow reflecting in me, but without it being the self-indulgent sitting in a dirty diaper? You know what I mean? It's like yeah. we've got to keep it flowing. And that is not easy to be resilient, emotionally resilient in these days, but it's what the skill we all need to learn. Yeah. And it's an intuitive skill. It is. How do you, if you hit a wall or if you hit a point of overwhelm, what do you do to kind of reset or get your balance back? So I do a lot of Donna Eden's techniques, the energy mm. medicine. Yeah. So she's amazing. Yeah. I have found her stuff helps me more than anybody else's very simple things to get my nervous system back online. And I also, um, I do EMDR with my, with a therapist. Mm. So, um, I do a lot of, uh, therapeutic work still and coaching. And I've always, if I'm going to teach others, I need to make sure I'm clean. You know totally. what I mean? I got to keep cleaning. Totally. The filter. So, um, so I will also listen to EMDR music, um, on Apple music, which brings your ner- your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous systems back online, because mm. I can just get overloaded. Mm. And then I play with my dogs. Yeah. And I watched. Who, I think I've been hearing in the background, there was some snoring going on yes, about 20 that's, minutes that's ago. And I thought, well, that's either her husband or the dog. And I'm no, not. No, it's, it's a little <laughs> tiny pum, one of three Pomeranians. And she is, I'm, I'm her obsession. So she sleeps in my arms at night. The other two sleep beside me, whatever. That's great. Um, no, and, and I think, and also getting really grounded, calling a friend, because the, the trick right now is to not stay, a tra- stay hostage to your head. Mm hmm. Right. And sometimes I need to cry. Yeah. And staying hostage to your head. It's funny. I was just talking about that this morning with a friend because I had it last week. You know, it's been, it's been, there's been a lot going on in the world. And I hit my own mini wall and, uh, and I had that hostage to my head for a day or so. And then what I, what I now know to remember is uh, this is in your head. And as soon as you speak to someone else, you are going to completely synchronize with what they're, even if their story is slightly different, even you today, Colette, it's always hilarious how it works. You said several things about your, your teenage years. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that was me too. That was me too. (laughs) And that's what I loved. I went to a lot of AA with my, um, my husband who, you know, very, you know, talks about his recovery journey a lot when we were first together, because I really wanted to understand. And it was uh, amazing. Like I remember saying to him, if everyone went to an AA meeting every day, not because of anything to do with substance, no. but just to sit the in world a world would be very where people different. have five minutes to tell you how they're feeling. You always come out of those meetings going, oh my God, I feel so much better because we all got to hear yeah. how everyone's doing and, and, and just, you know, a five minute window into everyone's world, the separation disappears. And it, yeah. yeah so, and, and it's, I think the other thing is, is that the 12 step program, you know, and the, the diversity inside the program, because the only thing we needed to have in common, not was nobody even knew what I did for a living for 20 years. Like I, you know, I made friends with people with from all walks of life. It wasn't important. What was important was our first name Absolutely. and that we were there to get closer to our divine nature and that we didn't want to drink a day at a time. Right. That was it. And so we saw each other, not from what we had, right. But what we had to offer there. And we, we were family, like, because we had to be, I mean, I I didn't like everybody and I'm sure nobody, not everybody liked me, but it was the concept of community where you were there for a common purpose. And so this is what I've 
I strive to do in my communities is to come there for a common purpose and make sure everyone feels welcome and letting people be themselves too. Like it's not one size fits all, except we do have a program like the 12 step program, for example, gives you steps that everybody knows and they can work on it together. Like my programs, I give them things to do with the Oracle cards to help them transform, you know? So community is so key these days, especially with what's going on, you know, Completely. what's going on, what has been going on, what may not be still going on, but we know what we're talking about. Yes, because also we're recording this in mid-March and this will probably yeah. come out mid-April. So who knows where the world is going to be at that point. And everybody should just know that transparently. That's weird, you know. Yeah, and I I, I will say this. I, I am going to say something about the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. even though it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, but um, I was feeling really messed up and not like, what's it all about? Why are we even here? You know, I was feeling those feelings. And I think that was my mini wall too. And then I decided to, you know, obviously we gave money. I'm, we're, we're very charitable. I don't like to virtue signal, so I'm not interested in, I mean, I will go boots on the ground and, and, and help. Mm -hmm. And I don't like advertising that on social media and stuff. I find that irritating. <laughs> but, but if I have resources, I'm going to share it. Sure. So I went on Etsy and ended up supporting. I went on there and you can give, the money goes directly to the Ukrainians' hands, right? And I ended up having these conversations with people because they write you in Russian or, or Ukrainian and then they translate it on Google and we go back and forth. I wrote them in. I just said, hi, I'm not buying what you're selling. Um, there was this, this factory that made hand-blown glass goblets for weddings, mm. right? And they were like, this thing was like, they had 20 people that were mothers that had kids to feed, et cetera. So I just said, hey. And we ended up in this conversation with a person who is right there. And then I got really excited because I, I met a few more people that way, like just for $3 and I would write them little love notes. And then, and then I would go to Airbnb. So uh, one weekend I was in five places in Ukraine. I was in Poland, <laughs> you know, and they were, you talk directly to the people who were being impacted. It wasn't on the news anymore. And that changed everything for me. So I think when I genuinely help someone else, not for a living, when yeah. I just help for the sake of it, that can get me out of any funk. Completely. Where I'm not exchanging anything. Like in my ability to, I mean, I'm successful. So of course, you know, that's why I tell people, like, don't feel guilty for being successful. Give more. Absolutely. We get to give more. Isn't that great? Absolutely. That is, that is, yeah. that is the truth of it. Yeah. No, so, I love that. And I wanted, I just wanted to bring it up. I know that we're, this is going to be out in April, but you know, you asked like, what do we do? And what do you do? Like, what do you do to get out of your this, I did the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I didn't do direct, but I have, I have a, a friend who is working very directly with a lot of the refugees. So I donated a, a couple of rounds of times to their efforts. Um, yeah. But I also hit a wall and I had the same right. thing as you. I had the whole I, I definitely had the what's the point, like kind what's of, the point? Yeah. You know, and I, I can go beyond that. I can speak to my guides. I can look at it from a spiritual perspective, but just on a human perspective yeah. it was just, I, and, and feeling what was going on in the world completely just overwhelmed me for, for a good week or so. And, you know, I have too. a very close friend. So I was, who's very intimate, you know, right there. So, so yeah, it was, it was, I think, but I think everybody was feeling that you, the, and then you and I would feel everybody too, on top of us. Yes. I, yes. Well, I don't know if you have emp empathy overload, but I get, I get. Oh, no, that's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. No, I, yeah. I was yeah. supposed to be doing, filming a course that I just canceled. I was like, there's no, yeah. there's no way anyone wants this on camera right now. Cause it will come, it will come out. So I just, I just kind of did a lot of, um, I did a lot of looking after my own nervous system and then helping yeah. in the ways that I could. Um, yeah. And kind I, of resetting. We have, um, there's a, a, there's a, uh, shipping company in Toronto that we have a big Ukrainian community. And my, mm. my friend, my only friend actually where I live in the farm area is Ukrainian from Ukraine. So, um, one of our friends is over there in the Ukraine and her best, everybody is Ukrainian except for me. So, um, but we went to Costco and filled up with like, we just felt good because we were both feeling depressed and like, let's just go yeah. to Costco and buy what they need. What do they need? So we're texting to uh, one of the women who's in Western Ukraine, which is now not safe. 
Um, but she was safe at the time. She goes, this is what we need. We need protein bars for the guys, uh, the soldiers backpacks. We need aspirin. There's no this, there's that, there's this. So we were there with our lists and it, and you know, it was, yes, it was material, but we had it to give, you know, and if and you don't needed. have it, you and if that's the element that you can give, it's needed. So give yeah. it and prayers. Totally. Right. And, and like, here's the thing, say it's over. Our world has changed. The darkness that you've tuned into, I have tuned into it too. It is an invitation for us to get connected, get reconnect with it, get over this polarizing. Like, let's just, <clears throat> you know, connect to our communities. We are connected. Like there's, there, we are, we are human beings, you know? And, and I think the two years of real of us looking at that, like the boil burst in the past exactly. two years. You know, and as spiritual teachers, which you are and what I am, you know, it's our job to show up for the people. We've had a lot of experience and we have to stay human too, but there is hope. We cannot give up hope. And it's an exciting time to be alive. And the darkness, I'm sorry, but light will always extinguish the dark. It just might get a little darker first. Yep. 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 Which is interesting because that's the thing you know I channel regularly for my my community um and that was you know we had a the day after the uh, invasion happened I was scheduled to have a broadcast for my portal community which is where we can go really deep it's not out on a social media platform so we don't have right. to worry so much about what might be said or not said yeah. um but it's also a, a core community and uh you know, on Facebook or do you have it a different place the, this is the portal. So this is my members community, which is we have that on my website. So oh, it's, see, it's I have to we're trying to figure that out to bring everybody off Facebook so that they can feel comfortable. Right. And, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So we, we had a call that had been it was supposed to be a week earlier. It's always the middle of the month. But for right. some reason that we scheduled it for the day after. Wow. Ukraine. So it was um, it was a it was a really intense but really important connection call. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, that thing, I remember in that the message, and we shared a piece of it on Facebook, we couldn't share the whole thing, because it, it wouldn't yeah, have worked, I get it. but we shared, we shared what we could. Um, but it was so interesting that exactly what you've said, you know, my guides have said now for a year or two, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so as you're watching and feeling it kind of happening, it it can knock your body, it can knock your emotions, and then you come back and you're like, okay, okay, yeah. well, where, what do we do now? Where do we go now? How do we balance ourselves, the world? What can we do? What can't we do? And also, I think knowing when you need to step back is oh, really yeah. important. Totally, 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 totally. It, we're, not every word has to come out of our mouths and not every, we are not here to do every everything. What I found too is I paint, right? So I'm, um, and I found painting incredibly grounding. So I'm, I've painted this thing. I, I find that by the time this comes out, maybe this has been auctioned already. You want to see it? Yes, it's please. Yeah, I'll, I'll show it to you. Okay. Everybody here, it's, it, it, this is April, but we're doing it here in March. So no one has bought this painting yet. <laughs> so you are going to be the first people to Fantastic. see it. Fantastic. But in the past. <laughs> okay. Hang on. I hope you can see this. So I... It's, it's almost, it's about two thirds the way finished. I paint really big paintings. I don't know if you can, oh, no, wait a sec. That's it's hilarious. It's getting canceled maybe by the background. That's an amazing face in the Hang middle of it. Hang on one second. Of... Hang on one second. Let me get my, that's hysterical, right? Because I am, I am in a, uh, how do I do the Zoom? Okay, wait, let, let me get out of my background. That's funny. Choose background, none. Ta-da, there she is. Aha. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful and very appropriate symbology as well. Right, and then these little faces. That's lovely, Colette. And I paint in, I paint mm. in matte and metallic. Yeah, mm. it's just beautiful. You, know, you can see the metallic around the edge of the leaves. Uh huh. So it's it's for me. It's been okay. Well, I can. I don't want to sit and think about it. Well, I'll paint a painting and auction it. That's what I'll do. You know, so so we can do things to not be in our heads that was completely. why I showed it. and here's and my actual house <laughs> yes hello house <laughs> colette i'm conscious of time so i know we're going to yes. have to stop in just a moment yes. but before we do go um obviously you have your oracle school yes. where, which is an September. eight month program to help people basically come online and take your gifts out into the world 
you have your members community, but you recently launched a, a podcast. I yes. love the title. It's called Into the Wooniverse. Oh, Inside the Wooniverse. Oh, Inside the Wooniverse. Okay. And just First. share a little bit about it because I know it was a big hit when it launched. Yeah. So um, I used to have a radio show with Hay House Radio. So, and I had it for like eight years. It was my favorite thing to do. <clears throat> and um, I kind of wanted to just talk to some of the people that I'd never spoken to and try my hand as an interviewer. Mm. So I'm the kind of, I'm at a stage in my career, I'm going to be 64 this summer. And, you know, I'm like, who can I help? Who could I bring forward? Who could I introduce, you know, and, and ta- have great conversations with. So I ended up deciding to do a podcast. So right now it's interview style. You're going to be on season two. And your husband would have to talk to him too. Um, I've interviewed some deck creators called Create, you know, Creators Corner. I have 12 interviews, really, really great interviews. And we did, but we really put in sound design. It's like it's it's not your typical, you know, it's it, it's got a lot of meat in it. Beautiful. And I sing, I sing at the end. Fantastic. Yeah, you have to hear it at some some point. Um, anyway, and then um, yeah, so we just really wanted to find a place where it was a little bit, I wanted to create a space where it was a little playful. Mm. That's why it's called the Wooniverse, right? Because everybody, it's woo-woo. Well, but so that's why it's called, it's a podcast brought to you from the corner of Fringe and Maine, right? So we talk about fringe subjects that are also in the mainstream, like astrology and like, you know, and, and like, um, as science celebrities and sages is basically what we're promising Perfect. people. And so far it's been amazing. That's awesome. Well, I, yeah. I only just, dis- I only discovered that you did this this morning or yesterday, I think. So I'm going to go and listen to some episodes and I love that you are bringing your music back. We talked about that yes. briefly before we started that you, you and Eric Rosse are again working yeah. together and there will be more music to come. So just um, like you and you and I might do a duet ourselves. I know we're talking about it. So <laughs> That would be cool. And I know there's so many things that you offer, but if people go to your main website, colettebaronreed.com, which we will put in the links in the show notes, they'll yeah. be able to find all the different elements there, won't they? Yeah. And you know, the best thing for people to do is we give a lot of stuff away for free mm-hmm. and we we give a lot of content. So <clears throat> is to just sign up for my newsletter. Um, we open our doors twice a year for the membership site. So it's not available, but people have snuck in. Um, if they go to cbrlove.com, they can. Um, but anyway, we're not, you know, there's nothing really offered. We do our Oracle school in September for eight months. And then I have a dream quest mastermind where I take 20 people, um, and on a journey for eight months and which is, it's for people who have had a level of success and influence in their life that want to go to another level of service of compassion and prosperity. So, you know, we're very, you, you have to apply for that, but that said, yeah, there's so much there, you know, OCM is great. And we, we both call our podcast ITW, which is hysterical. Yes. Right? Is so, and I, I'm like, really? Oh, that's so funny. Anyway. Well, this has been. Come and lovely. see me. Come and see me. Yeah. No, <laughs> we will put the links to the website in the show notes. And if you're listening again, it's colettebaronreed.com. Colette, thank you so much. This has been so lovely to meet you. And thank you for sharing so much about your early journey and how it led to your now journey. And I I know many people are going to be very inspired. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. I love you so much. Big, big love, my friend. Thank you. So thank you everyone for tuning in and you can check out everything Colette at colettebaronreed.com. We will see you next time on Impact the World. Thanks again, Colette. For those of us who are sensitive, intuitive, or walking a spiritual path, It is our practices and the support that we have in our life that often is the key to how well we can walk through life. Nine years ago, I created the portal to be an answer to that need for members of my community who wanted to go more in depth with my work. And while my work is still very much a centerpiece of the portal, we have now added other teachers, other voices, other offerings so that the portal can become a well-rounded place for you to receive nourishment and be uplifted, shifted and supported every single month. Here is a look at some of the offerings that you receive every month as a portal member. Once a month, I do a 90-minute live video broadcast. 
don't worry if you can't be there live, everything in the portal is provided to you as a replay. But doing it live is a chance for me to be with you as a community. And in that broadcast, I channel I speak about the energies of the month and expand on my monthly energy update and also take some community questions. Every month you will also receive an MP3 and the MP3 will either be a channeled message from my guides the Z's set to original music from Davor Bozik or it will be an energy alchemy meditation or some other energy teaching. These will be put into your members library and you will have access to them to stream and download. We also give you access to a classics library where we take eight classic recordings from recent years so that you can listen to more. Qigong and wellness teacher Stephen Washington gives you an exclusive Qigong sequence every single month. It's called the Body Energy Update and he takes the themes from my monthly energy updates on YouTube and creates a movement sequence for you designed to support you and your process as we go through each month. Stephen is also a wonderful meditation teacher, and so you will have access to a library of short, digestible meditations from him. As soon as you join, you will also get access to our bonus intuitive power workshop. This was a tour that we took to several different countries a couple of years ago, and we had it professionally filmed. So you will be able to watch a four and a half hour video workshop where both myself and Steven teach you about accessing and owning your intuition in a deeper way. And to round all of this out, we have special member discounts on courses of mine. We also have special music playlists each month. One set of songs designed to help soothe you and one set of songs designed to get you moving. And last year, we brought to the portal something I've wanted to do for a very long time, The Portal Presents. It's where I get to invite some incredible teachers, creatives, healers, musicians into the portal. And every month we spotlight one of them where they deliver an on-camera teaching specifically for our portal members. It's a beautiful new feature. We have had some incredible people coming in and we've got some amazing people lined up for the next year. And the final aspect of the portal is mine and my team's favorite. It's the community energy. So as well as having a private members forum inside the portal, for those of you who aren't on social media, we also have a private moderated Facebook group exclusively for portal members. This is where so many members get to share what they're experiencing, things they're learning, people they're enjoying, and essentially connecting you with people from all over the world who are focused on similar interests to you. My aim with the portal has always been to offer you as much value for your membership as possible. And I feel like in the last year or so, we have really been able to maximize that. So we look forward to welcoming you to the portal and we hope it is a place that can nourish your mind, your body and your soul. Big love.